Hello everybody, Ian Lee here. Hope y'all are doing well today. Um, so, I am essentially starting fresh on my YouTube channel here. I've got some of my old videos still up and you can always go watch those for fun if you want, but I'm, I'm a, gonna start over in a sense. Um, I started the channel about a year or so ago and now that I've got, I have a better idea of what I want to offer on this channel um, and what I want to say and be and uh, cultivate, um, I decided I'd, I'd give it another go. And I'm re really excited this time. I'm really excited. I think I have a much better uh, idea of where to go and, and what to share and what to teach. So what I want to be talking about, at least for the, you know, for the foreseeable future is, you know, jazz violin, jazz and Western swing violin. When I was getting started on jazz violin, I just didn't feel like there was a ton of information available. I really had to kind of uh, pick around to figure out and and there are some wonderful teachers out there and there is there is some stuff available out there. Um, some great people like Christian Howes uh, doing some wonderful things. But I still didn't feel like, you know, the, especially when it comes to fiddle, um, you kind of have I think bluegrass is a really dominating source, which is great. Bluegrass is wonderful music, but I wanted to learn how to play like Stefan Grappelli and Stuff Smith. And of course I love Western Swing. I'm here in Central Texas. I wanted to explore more Western Swing. So what I want to share with y'all is just what I've accumulated through my years of study and, and finding teachers and my own mistakes and trials and et cetera. And of course I'm, I'm always still studying and practicing and learning as well. So as I learn, you get to learn more as well. So I'm really excited to share these things with you today. Um, I thought today we could pick apart the tune Right or Wrong. It was written in 1921, so it's a, a hundred years old today. Um, and it was one of Bob Will's more popular tunes. I think his big hit was New San Antonio Rose, but Right or Wrong is just such a great tune. And if you're a beginner improviser, which is also, you know, what I want to offer to on this channel is information to kind of your beginner improvisers. Um, People are looking to get into this stuff and just don't really know where to start. Maybe you're a classical mus musician who wants to get into different fiddle styles and you're not sure where to go and how to tread those waters. And, I, and I'm a classical musician, at least in my training as well, I trained Suzuki and, and still love to play classical music, but it was fun to learn how to improvise and get these things under my belt. So yeah, let's just do the first half of Right or Wrong. I'm gonna talk about just some different kind of scales that you can play through different ways to line out the chord changes and to really get yourself um, feeling, you know, just um, confident with the movement of that tune and hearing the sounds in your head and getting what those sounds will feel like uh, in your fingers. Um, I'll say right now, I'm gonna use some, of the, again, some of the things that I've learned over the years. I've recently, in the last six months or so gotten really into the teachings of Barry Harris, who's an amazing jazz educator. I suggest you YouTube him as well. Just wonderful stuff. Um, he says it all so beautifully. And there's another channel called Things I've Learned from Barry Harris. There's a gentleman named Chris Parks. He's a guitar player and he teaches the things that he's learned from Barry Harris. And he's an excellent teacher. So there's gonna be some similar concepts, you know, a lot of that kind of stuff floating around along with some of my own viewpoints, et cetera. So, but um, Barry just lays it out so beautifully, so beautifully, at least as a, as a starting point. So um, so yeah, let's talk about right or wrong. Why did I pick this tune as the first one? Well, what's really nice about the song is one, it's, it, it's gonna be at a medium swing, a nice medium tempo, nothing too complex um, in terms of the chord changes, a lot of dominant chords, and they all hang out for a couple bars at a time, more or less. So that's what's another really fun thing about this song, especially, again, if you're a beginner improviser, you get to kinda, you don't have to blow through chord changes, you know, you're not learning like a, you're not trying to do like rhythm changes, like a, a bird rhythm, Charlie Parker rhythm changes, and uh, and trying to like blow through blow through the chords at like 220 beats per minute or something. You know, it's it's a little more, probably, probably playing at 170 or so, and you're just um, getting to really hang out with these chords a little while, which is fun, because you get to, do a little more experimentation. So I wanna talk about um, today the first part of Right or Wrong, playing over those chords and some general concepts when you're improvising. So yeah, let's talk about that tune. Um, right or Wrong is in G, and it actually starts on the sixth chord, so it doesn't start on the one chord. The whole form resolves to the one 
uh, the one chord, which is G. Wrong, I'm still in love with you. Right? So it starts on the sixth chord. And they turn the sixth chord into a dominant chord. This is a very common thing in jazz, but especially Western swing. You see a lot of Western swing. There's another great tune called Bring It On Down To My House. And that's one, six, two, five. And the, and the, the six, two, five are all dominant functions. Okay, normally the sixth chord, right, is a, is a minor seven or diatonically speaking, it's usually a minor seven. So we start with this nice E seven for two bars. We get an A seven for two bars, so it's a two chord. And then we do a D7 for two bars, and then G for two bars. Now, um, the next part of the tune, we're gonna use some changes that uh, George Strait actually introduced to the song, I think when he made it a hit in the 80s, I think that's right, maybe 90s. Um, so those changes, I think normally there, what it does, it essentially hangs on the one for at least another couple bars. Well, what George Strait did is he introduced this really great little movement, and it's a really common theme. It happens like pennies from heaven, for example. Um, it's this, the one chord with the three in the bass. So it's a G chord with a B in the bass. And then it goes to a flat three diminished. Um, so we have B flat diminished. And then we have an A minor seven to a D seven. And I have my guitar here just to illustrate this movement. Because I think it's cool to hear it. So let's just kind of peek through this a little bit together. So we have, we have right or wrong. That's that E7. I'll always love you. My A7. True, you're gone. I can't forget. Right or wrong. On the guitar, this is a one chord with three in the bass. So we have a B note right here. Wrong. I'll keep on dreaming. Okay. Still I wake, I wake with that same old regret. So um, that movement, I'll, just, just so you can see, you know, a lot of these things repeat themselves. That's the great thing about spending time with a tune and really getting to know it, is it ends up, maybe it's a different key signature or something, but it's, it's the same movement. So, things from heaven. Every time it rain, rains, it rains, pennies from heaven, don't you know each that same same thing it's one chord three in the bass flat three diminished it's very very pretty sound uh, to get familiar with there so okay so um, we have that and the way that works is you have that one chord with three in the bass for one bar you have the flat three diminished for one bar you have a minor seven to D7 and those each get one bar and then we come back to an A7 a dominant for two bars and then a D7 for two bars. And then we go to the next part of the form. But I think we'll do the next part of the form in the next video. So let's talk about some basic things that we can do. Just start playing through the tune and familiarizing ourselves with the chord changes and maybe get them, getting them memorized a little bit. Um, one of the first things we can do is we can just arpeggiate the chords. Just nice little simple, um, just playing the arpeggio. Like for example, we have an E7 on those first two bars. So we'll go... So we'll go one and two and three, four. So you'll hold that D note, the last note of an E7. You'll hold it. Um, so it would, it would look like one and two and, and that and would be tied to a half note. Ba -de -de, ba -de -de -da. And then you do that again. Ba -de -de -da. And you play an A7. Same thing with the D7. Now it's probably more appropriate to play a G6 right there instead of a G major seven. Um, but it's, it's fine either way, you know, do both. You know, so a G6 would be a, a G triad. And then you'd play E versus F sharp. Now, when we play the um, the G with the B in the bass to the flat three diminished to 
A minor seven to D seven. What I would suggest you do is again, just play G and then arpeggiate the flat three diminished, which there's a couple ways you can do that. You can do it here. So you can play B flat, D flat, open E, G. That's a common diminished shape on the violin. Da -dee -dee -dee. Right? And then um, you can play A minor seven. You know, play your D seven. And then you do those exact same arpeggiations for the A seven and the D seven. Um, right there at the end before we go into the second half of the form. Now, another really great way to play through these changes, and this is a very Harris thing, is to run these scales that belong to each chord um, and run them in, in such a way that they line up in this nice rhythmic fashion. Um, and this is a great way to play through tunes. I just started experimenting with this in the last, you know, again, six months or so, but it's so much fun. The arpeggiation thing is cool. I don't dislike it. Um, uh, uh, the sax player named Chad LB, who's another really great YouTuber and educator. I, I'm studying with him currently and have started studying with him last year. He's a wonderful, wonderful musician, excellent human being, just all, all the right things. So you can um, go check out his stuff as well. He does some really great jazz stuff. Um, but um, I really love the way Barry's system lines out as well. So what we do is we apply a scale to each chord change essentially. Um, which is not as complex as it sounds and we just run those and we get the sound and then we get to kind of see what we have to work with right so for example if we're playing an e7 we're going to play an e dominant scale for you modal people out there that the term for that in modes is mixolydian but the dominant scale is great so um if you're you know a classical violinist or someone who's you know played violin but is um, unfamiliar with the, the look of that or um or the sound or shape of that, you're gonna play one, starting on this E on the D string. You're gonna play two, three. See how they're, I'm gonna use language like far apart. So one, two, three, far apart, right? This, this would be close together, like one, two, three, close together. So that shape, play open A, and then one, two, three, close together. And the sound of that is this. Okay. Now, the way Barry has you do this is he has you run up to not the next tonic or the octave, so he doesn't have you go. He actually has you just run up to the seventh, the dominant seven. Okay, and it's great. So that's one and two and three and four and one and two and three, and you have a one beat before you play the next scale degree. It's really cool stuff. So we have this. Okay, and then we play over A7. Now here's the great thing, well, about stringed instruments in general. Um, you know, it works for the violin just like the guitar. You can play an, an a, a dominant scale from the open A. That's what you want. Or you can just shift over that shape to this A, A note on the low G. And you can just... It's a great way to play it too. Um, so that way you're using the same pattern too. Right? And then we'll play D7. So we have... Beautiful. And then you play the G major scale. Same thing. You're just running each scale up to its tonic. And you're running through that. Now we're going to come to this little uh, moment of, again, the, um, the, the major, the tonic, the one chord, with its third in the bass, so G major with B in the bass, down to flat three diminished, down to A minor seven to D seven. This is a really important moment to be aware of in terms of how you practice and think about chords and changes. And it's why I'm not a super big fan of the whole arpeggiation thing as the only way of memorizing chord changes and thinking about them. Um, but let's start with the first couple of chords. So we have the one chord, three in the bass, flat three diminished. Um, what you can do is just play G major again. 
but just till you get to F, okay? Just to, or, yeah, F sharp, sorry. And then you go, run down that little diminished arpeggio right there and that would be a seven note scale as well one let's see one two three four five six seven you have to double check my math there so there's there's that right there da -da 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 -da, right and so you and all you're doing there is spelling out that diminished chord just in arpeggiated form running down so you're going up the G major scale And then that leads you into playing a D7 scale. Now, what you do next over A minor seven to D7 is play just a D7 scale. Because when you're an improviser and you're a single note improviser and you're not having to think about the chords, I mean, being aware of the changes, yes, but you're not, you don't have to play the harmony of A minor seven to D7, like a piano player or a guitarist would. You're not keeping chords, you're improvising, you're playing single notes. So what you can do is just think five, just think D7. So you run A minor seven to D7 like you were playing two bars of D7. It's a really beautiful thing. It simplifies it so much. And there's so many things that we can do over the top of that. And, and I'll get into all of that more and more later. It's gonna be really fun to talk about all the ways that we can play through this tune. Let's just start here. So. Now we have, uh, we're gonna do the same thing. We have two bars of A7, two bars of D7. So, whoop. I don't know what I was playing there. <laughs> okay, and that's the first half of right or wrong. Now you're gonna wanna do that with a metronome. You can do it with the metronome on beat two and four or one and three. I prefer one and three for a few reasons. Um, there's a teacher named Hal Galpert I suggest you look up and he talks about keeping time with your foot on one and three because you're more relaxed and it makes you play more easily versus, you know, there's if you have a drummer with you, they're, they're, the snare's hitting on two and four anyways. So I, I just prefer to practice that way. So a lot of people prefer to practice with a two and four, but I would suggest picking one of those two uh, for now. And then you want to maybe build up to, you know, 150 to 170 beats per minute and just run those scales and get comfortable with that. And of course, run your G major scale as a whole because we are in the key of G and uh, that'll come down the road, but. I like to run scales as high as I can in first position and as low as I can in first position, no matter where I start. So even if I started on E flat. So, uh, enough rambling for now. We will pick up with the rest of Right or Wrong uh, soon, and then we'll just talk about improvising over the tune and getting through some different ideas, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, yeah, thank you guys for watching as always. Appreciate anybody's time and energy. And I'm available for private lessons. If you wanna reach out to me, I'll leave my email in the description below. And um, let's see. Yeah, I think that's about it. Oh yeah, like, subscribe share, all that. All right. Happy practicing, y'all.